um, with that we are in the process of recording. So if you had any reservations about that, it's too late to express them. This is this is all about democracy and transparency. Yeah, so great. So I'll t uh, Cliff, I'll take it for a few minutes. And I was going to say, Ruth Ann, just you you run the run the thing, and uh, I'm happy to see my. I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn to you when we get to MDH, and then you take the rest. And I appreciate yep. the partnership, and thank you very much, and welcome yep. to everyone uh, to your December first Rabbit Rabbit Day uh led commission meeting if you don't know rabbit rabbit day i'll explain it offline but um always a good thing for kids uh we are very uh honored today to uh have uh secretary horacio tablada who is joining us and i know uh we'll have a few things to say we are going to uh table the minutes and approve them uh in 23 uh, in January 23, because uh, we learned that we just don't survive without Wendy Phillips at the helm uh, handling uh, those matters for us. So uh, we will table that uh, to ensure that they are full and complete uh, and uh, do that then. But uh, Mr. Secretary, I know you have some announcements for us as we start this. Uh, I have a couple of things I would like to say to the commission as well, and then um, I will turn it over uh, to Cliff Mitchell, who's going to stand in to chair the meeting uh, as we uh, move forward. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, can I turn it over to you? Or maybe I see him. Yes. Thank you, Ruthanne, is at MDE. And as two things I want to say today, one is, as uh, as you know, we're all in a, in a transition mode. Uh, the former elect will take office in January. You know, there changes from the government, but one thing does not change. That does not change. It and that's something that has been our passion at MDE and, and all you, everyone in this commission. And, uh, Mr. Secretary, you thing up a bit. Um, if you might start over, I think you've been breaking up at least for me and maybe others. Um, so maybe get in a little bit better position. Okay. Can you hear me? But I was on top of Bay Bridge. Okay. Well, um, okay. Keep going. Don't stop on the bridge and don't go up, and uh, we'll try to hear you better. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, and I'll get back in a second. You sound better now. You were yeah. better. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me better yeah. now? Uh, and Paul, I don't know what's uh, okay. on the screen. Just if uh, we keep getting a lot of movement there, if we might want to keep that steady. Okay. Let's let's now we're going to start from the top again. Uh, Secretary, go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you again. Good morning, everyone. And it's my pleasure to always join this lead poison prevention commission. Uh, it's that of the all the commissions and boards at FDP has always been one of my favorite ones, and because been doing what I think does real work. And and I was starting to say that, as you know, we are in a transition of government, uh, which is very. Uh, uh, smooth as far as I'm concerned, and even though there may be changes at the top as far as in governance and other positions, uh, one thing does not change, which is our commitment and dedication of uh, to fight against lead poison in the state, in this whole state. So we are, everyone in this group, everyone from Ruth End and everyone in the commission, everyone in the agencies, we're totally committed and dedicated to fight to eradicate lead poisoning among the children of America. And so that's something that is will not change. That's, some, that's a commitment that we have and continue to be. And the second thing I would like to announce, as you, some of you may have already heard, but uh, Kaylee Lalaker, director of the materials, uh, you know, she resigned and state service and, and she went to what I would consider 
a passion of her life, which is working on circular economy of sustainable materials. That's something she's been working for many years. And uh, so she'd be in the private sector in, a, in some company uh, out of state. Uh, so the uh, so as far as that, uh, I announced yesterday uh, the appointment of uh, Tyler Abbott, who has been working as my chief of staff as director of land materials administration. Tyler has a tremendous knowledge, is very accessible, great passion for the environment and protection of public health, and very knowledgeable of what happens in the administration and the whole department for that matter. So and I hate to lose him as my chief of staff. Uh, however, I think he's a big, a big addition to the land materials administration. And uh, so uh, that's, I wanted to make that announcement personally myself because uh, I don't know how many of you knew Kaylee had let, resigned two, two weeks ago. Which I'm uh, so anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Keep, keep the good work. And, uh, and keep the passion and this fight, the good fight of eradicating the poison in, in the state of Maryland. Well, fantastic. And uh, we, we look forward to the great work of the staff and uh, Tyler and Paula. Uh, and uh, this is an important issue. Yeah, I want to add a little bit to this. Um, People may know that I accepted a role to be the policy governance uh, or the policy uh, executive co-chair for uh, the governor-elect and the lieutenant governor for housing. Um, and so I will be working uh, diligently on that through February. But I wanna just convey this to the members of the public that are listening and to the members of the commission that are listening. And that is uh, in the election, Maryland chose a governor uh, who is on the record as deeply committed to the eradication of childhood lead poisoning, um, who is deeply committed to health-based housing and committed uh, to lifting uh, communities. And so I say that to this end, um, for everybody who's on the phone here as, um, citizen volunteers and what we are doing, uh, there is the opportunity to weigh in um, for the climate and environment committees and to the housing uh, and community development and the Department of or the Health uh, Policy Committee um, through moremillermd.com to make suggestions, um, to provide policy recommendations, uh, to advance barrier uh, reduction. And I encourage you to do that um, as we move uh, forward. I, and I know uh, there are many good ideas uh, that people do not uh, often think that are going to be heard. I can just tell you from the experience on the housing, uh, as we prepare to do the housing report, um, that is being encouraged that is being heard uh, and I just want from this commission standpoint but for the people listening uh, to feel that they have an opportunity to make recommendations even about how we improve uh, this work which I hope we'll always discuss in these meetings but I wanted um, to do that um, as well so uh, and appreciate everybody in public service who is doing uh, the really good work there. I know we had some old business on the health department open forums and the takeaways there, and we're going to be talking about the MDH evaluation of universal testing and home visits. Um, and, um, and I just want to say to Paul, I don't, uh, is there an opportunity for us to maybe put that agenda on a screen that, that might be a little more stable for folks? Um, but Cliff, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'll stay on as a participating member until I have to leave for another meeting. And appreciate is this, taking is this. Is this better? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. I think okay. so. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I think we need to do first is just um, to ensure we have quorum from the commission. So if you are on the line as a commissioner, uh, could you please identify yourself publicly? Uh, to ensure that people know that you're here um, 
So I see that we have uh, Mandela. Yes. Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Too. Anna Davis. Yes, I'm here. Cliff Mitchell. Uh, present. Now, Paul Rogers, I think I saw. Here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Camille, I don't know if you're the actual representative or if it's Mary Beth. Um, but I think you're here for the city. Is that right? It's actually Mary Beth, but she's not feeling well today, but I'm happy to sit in. Okay. So, but thank you. Jacob? Hi, good morning. This is Jacob. Good. Thank you. Um, any, I know that Barbara Moore is not able to attend this morning because she's dealing with an extraordinarily high lead case. Did I miss any others uh, on the call? Yes, I'm Joanne Murray. I'm an architect with Office of School Facilities, and we've had some changes recently. Fred Mason, who used to be our director, has moved on to City of Baltimore to do good work there. And um, Jillian Storms, who's been with Office of School Facilities for 15 years, is the acting director, but she is unable to attend today, so I'm listening in for her. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, anyone else? I think Susan Kleinhammer's on as well. Susan, are you on by phone? Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any other commissioners that want to identify themselves. Paula, you represent the department? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, Cliff, I'm not sure that we have quorum. I'll, I'll leave that to Paula, but I would uh, say uh, just very quickly, uh, if I don't talk to everybody, happy holidays, and we'll reconvene in January with uh my uh, participation, and there you go, Cliff, and a good picture of a guy and a dog. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Norton. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the coup was bloodless, uh, and uh, you are now all stuck with me and Paula uh, as as the as the meeting uh heads so uh just fair warning um so uh, just a couple of things before um we start the first is and i ruth ann i suspect um uh you would share this first welcome tyler and congratulations and uh it's great to see you in this new role and we are looking forward to working with you i am looking forward to working with you uh in this new capacity and uh very much appreciate uh secretary tablada's remarks and um uh i am very excited about the opportunity to work with you on a number of projects um including lead poisoning prevention and other environmental issues so uh, yeah i look forward to working with you more as well and uh, everybody here on the commission I know we've had some great interactions in the past. I'm glad I can narrow down a little bit more rather than, you know, overseeing uh, issues with you for the whole department. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And um, so not to put you on the spot, but I will, because this is the uh -oh. problem with having absolute power, um, which is, um, do you have any sort of initial thoughts about the things you are uh, intend to focus on or any specific priorities in the lead? poisoning prevention or area that you think um, uh, are, are going to be of particular interest or uh, in interest to you? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for uh, putting me on the spot in my second day on the job. Uh, luckily, this isn't a new issue for me, and I've been working on lead legislation for the past few years. So, uh, you know, with the bill that was passed last year, uh, focusing on how we're going to implement that lower blood lead level, I know that's going to be a challenge. Uh, but, you know, working with the department so that we can staff up, make sure that we have those increased inspectors, uh, make sure that we have smooth transition going into it. Fantastic. Yeah, which is what I was hoping and expecting you were going to say. So All it's right. a perfect segue, yes. and that's, that's terrific. Thank you very, very much. Um, 
So um, our first set, uh, old business is uh, just follow up on the open forum with the um, uh, members of the health departments who joined us for case management discussions last uh, last meeting. Um, so I, I know that we had some discussion at the time. Uh, did anybody want or uh, want to express any additional concerns, questions, or issues um, related to health department and local health department uh, case management capacity as it relates to um, lead poisoning prevention overall or implementation, as Tyler mentioned, of the new lower lead level, which went into effect um, on October 28th? Any concerns or questions related to those discussions? And I will say, and I, I know Ruth Ann and I have talked about this, um, our intention is to continue those discussions and bring additional staff from additional health departments back as we move through the year on a regular basis to check in with them. Uh, and uh, MDE and I meet regularly with them as well. But Camille. I just want to make sure um, that we keep in the back of our heads and acknowledge that the acknowledgement of the lower level um, still hasn't caught up with either local health department's health code or whatever's going on in their jurisdiction because we're in that funky kind of place where we're acknowledging the lower level, but we don't have any enforcement authority to really do anything about it, yep. um, even though we're gently nudging. So that's a year of us on that tightrope of saying to landlords, it would be in your best interest if you, yep. but we don't have any enforcement authority. And I'm not sure if other departments are in that space, but I know that's where we exist right now. So. Yeah. I, and, and I think you more than, more than some other departments, because you have a larger number of cases to begin with and a larger number in that 3.5 to five range. Uh, Dr. Rogers. Yeah, because just a quick question. Um, I've been putting together these lectures for the um, ECHO program through the AAP national level. And I wondered if some of these lectures may be useful for local health departments. Is, is there, I don't know if you call it CME or whatever at the local de health department level. But I wonder if some of these lectures may be useful for the uh, health department uh, lead people. I Paul, that's a wonderful suggestion, and uh, I would take you up on that in a heartbeat. Uh, but I think that, um, first of all, I'm happy to talk offline with you about how to do that. I, my sense, we actually meet uh, on a quarterly basis with all the lead nurses across the state. Um, and uh, if you are able to make one of those meetings, um, we would be delighted, I think, to have a presentation. And I see Camille nodding, but I think that the staff generally would very much appreciate that, uh, in part because usually I'm the one who's talking about this, these issues, and they would rather have anybody. But I think having especially someone who's qualified um, uh, would be uh, greatly appreciated uh, as, a, as an adjunct to that. Great. We'll talk offline. And I, I talked to folks at National AAP, and they gave me a free pass to use these uh, lectures wherever it would be possible that they would be received. So we could chat more about that then. So I think that, uh, and thanks, Dr. Wydis, for that. Um, uh, you'll get take, you, you'll be, you will also be taken, uh, um, have the ability to take advantage of this for sure. But um, uh, Paul, I think one of the things that I will tell you we are planning, or I am planning at the department, is to do some additional uh, continuing medical education through AAP this year. And uh, so I'm very much interested in talking with you about this because I want to continue the work that we're doing on asthma as well as lead poisoning prevention, radon, and other healthy housing related topics. It would great to be happy to talk. And basically what I did was take the slides that the AAP provided nationally and mod I modified them extensively for Maryland. Yep. They're focused mainly on Maryland and in like, you know, sources as well as resources in Maryland too. But again, I, I will we'll chat more offline. <laughs> no, that's great. 
That's great. Uh, I see Paula, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, um, Cliff. Uh, just going back to the preparation for the lower blood lead levels, um, I'm wondering, Camille, um, did uh, they lower the blood lead level in your regulations when it was lowered to five? Yes, and they those 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 brand new regs, excuse me, because I've been working on them for a year, are actually in legislative review right now. They're sitting in the in the legal office, and they folk have thirty days to comment. So that's where we're kind of sitting with it. And Camille, um, are they written as? five micrograms or are they written as the blood lead reference value at a given time? So they were written at five micrograms and then Camille had to go back and change it to whatever the CDC reference level is, oh. which is why it's still sitting there. So that's what, so you are actually going to adopt the CDC blood lead reference value as your city? We're, we're making every attempt to do so. Yeah. Okay, and I understand that it hasn't passed yet, so it's this is still in the, as we say in English literature, the subjunctive case. Absolutely, and Dr. DeRaza hasn't had a chance to peek at it yet, but I've keep, I've literally got everything ready to yeah. get to that next step. Very yeah. good, very good, Camille. No, that's terrific. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, any other, any other, Thoughts on the local health department. Um, I, I will say, I uh, speaking on behalf of local health departments, which I'm not authorized to do, uh, I think they very much appreciate the opportunity to be heard about the challenges that they have. And I think the commission uh, really benefits from the insight of the people who are actually doing the work on the ground. So um, I'm sure that Ruth Ann, who is no longer uh, present because she had to go for another meeting. Um, I'm sure Ruth Ann is interested in continuing this dialogue with the uh, local health departments. Okay, so <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is uh, me, myself, and I. And I, I just want you to know that, that, that um, uh, frequently this is the way I run a meeting, which is just to talk continuously. But um, uh, in the next presentation, I'm going to be doing a presentation. Please interrupt me. I know sometimes that's difficult to do, but uh, this should be a discussion, uh, not a solo soliloquy. Although, you know, I'll do a soliloquy if it really seems appropriate. Yeah, no, thanks, exactly. All right, so um, which one is? I think it's this one. Let's see if this is full screen. So this should now be full screen from every for everybody. Uh, Paula, can you see this? Okay. Yes, sir. Okie dokie. All right. So um, I was asked uh, to talk about childhood blood lead testing in Maryland. And uh, so just to start and to set the stage, I want to remind everybody that both the Department of Health and the Department of the Environment are responsible for blood lead uh, poisoning prevention here in the state. We in the Department of Health within the Environmental Health Bureau, uh, COMAR 10.11.04, that's COMAR 10.11.04, um, uh, of the maternal and child health regulations are the regulations um, uh, that are responsible for telling physicians in the state what they are supposed to do regarding blood lead. And the way those regulations work is they're set up, there are two parts to those regulations. Well, actually two parts to the blood lead testing framework in Maryland. The first part is the lead testing targeting strategy. And that is the document that defines areas at risk in the state for childhood lead poisoning prevent, uh, exposure uh, or, for, or childhood lead poisoning. Uh, and the second are the regulations that are linked to the targeting plan 
that specify the testing requirements for healthcare providers um, based on the at definition of at-risk areas. So, as you remember, most of you, at least some of you, the previous lead testing targeting strategy, which was written most recently in 2004, um, defined areas in the um, areas of the uh, state based on primarily housing age plus social demographics as areas at risk for lead poisoning. And they were not surprising to anybody here. The older areas of, of uh, all of Baltimore City, uh, much of Baltimore County, uh, the cities of Cumberland, Frederick, um, uh, Hagerstown, uh, segments of the Eastern Shore, um, but newer sections of the um, county uh, of the of the counties. Um, which were had more recent housing, uh, did not have, uh, were not designated as at risk. When we uh, did an analysis of lead testing uh, and blood leads in the state in 2014 and 2015 at the health department, uh, we determined through careful uh, assessment of the evidence that there were in fact no sections of the state that could be considered essentially lead free children were identified in every part of the state uh, with lead poisoning and after uh, a great deal of internal discussion uh, the department decided to re redefine the entire state as being at risk of lead poisoning which meant that when we revised the regulations in 2016 that all children regardless of where they lived um, uh, were now to be tested for lead poisoning or lead uh, blood lead uh, at the ages of 12 and 24 months uh, you will remember that Medicaid has traditionally, ever since the early 1990s, required for all children who are enrolled in EPSTT, early prevention, screening, diagnosis, and treatment, uh, that they be tested at 12 and 24 months in Maryland, regardless of where they live. But this now brought in a large number of children who previously were not required to be tested and added them to the ranks of children who required testing. So uh, on March 28th, the new regulations um, uh, went into effect. Um, and uh, uh, the way we did that split and phased, phased that in was uh, for children who were born prior to January 1st, 2015, they were tested under the old regime, which is to say the old targeting plan. So if they lived in Montgomery County or Harford County or other areas that had not previously been considered at risk under the 2004 targeting plan, uh, children at, in that period who were born before January 1st of 2015 did not need to be tested. But children born subsequently, January 1st, 2015 and after, uh, were under the new testing targeting plan and they all required testing at 12 and 24. Any questions about that for people who are for whom this may be new? All right. Dr. Rogers. I, I saw a little bit off uh, something here. Are these slides going to be available to download? Um, yes, they will be available. Great. Thank you. Of course. Because they're going to be important for my talks. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Uh, uh, Paul, I anticipated that, which is why they are they are relatively clean. All right. Good. So, um, so in late 2019, um, one of the things that we pledged when we revised the regulations is that we would actually look at the experience and the data 
uh, after a period of time of, a, we said three years, uh, to look at the um, uh, lead testing data and reevaluate the testing targeting strategy. And the whole point of that, as you all know in public health, is to evaluate what you've done and then figure out whether it's working or not and whether you should continue or modify it. So late, 1990, uh, late 2019, uh, we began to evaluate the, the impacts of the regulatory changes uh, and um, uh, we did that um, in order to do three, to do accomplish three goals. One is to measure the impacts of the changes on childhood blood lead testing rates. Two is to look at whether or not it changed the number of children identified with elevated blood leads as defined in law. And third is to, based on the findings, decide what to do next, whether we needed to change things. So that was late 2019, and then we moved smoothly and seamlessly into early 2020. Um, and then I can't remember what it was. Something happened that got our attention. I have no idea what it was. Something called COVID, and the bottom fell out of all of the other stuff that I was doing. Um, and uh, we ended up significantly delayed in our evaluation, which is why it's now being presented to you. The other thing that happened, which didn't exactly delay the evaluation, but has informed our policy recommendations, is the change in the CDC blood lead reference value from five micrograms to 3.5. And the passage of HB uh, House Bill 1110. Thank you, Ty, and other advocates. So uh, this is what has happened to blood lead testing rates uh, in Maryland prior to and then with the introduction of the change in testing requirements. And if you look particularly at that yellow line that really sort of tells you the story overall. And then the details of that story are in those histograms, those bar graphs separately. So um, if I can point out to you um, uh, that if you look, the uh, blue bars represent children who are tested at 12 months, the orange bars represent the children tested at 24 months, and the gray bars represent the children tested who are generally older than 12 and 24 months. It represents actually two groups of children. Um, uh, uh, it represents children who are under their 12 month visit. Some children very, very rarely, but occasionally, will be tested at one month or two months, and that happens occasionally. Uh, but the vast majority of those children in the gray bar actually represent children older than 24 months, but under six years of age. Um, and usually those are children who have not previously had a lot. So they are, uh, that's usually a uh, pre-child care, pre-kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, or first grade test because they're entering a licensed or a public program, and they are required to be to have at least one test. And at that point, if they haven't been tested, uh, they they will get a blood test. So I just want to take one moment to just point out, uh, which we'll do in more detail in subsequent slides, uh, some features of these uh, of this um, uh, uh, graph. One is that remember that our regulations went into effect in 2016 and really 2016 is the transition year so overall if you look at the number of children who are tested they went from approximately 120,000 to approximately 140,000 so that was a significant increase overall in the number of children tested now, you're going to ask, wait, what happened in 2019 and 2020? 
Uh, and I don't think that'll come as a surprise to you because we've talked about it already that COVID happened in 2020 and everything fell off the map. So that's why that curve went down like that. Um, and it's going to stay down for a while. I mean, I, we've talked about that, but it is going to stay down for a while. The second thing is, if you look, the way to look at this graph, or one way to look at this graph, is to look at the changes in the testing rates uh, from 2016 to 2017 to 2018, um, and note that the biggest increases in testing actually came for children tested at 24 months. There were increases in the children tested at 12 months. But if you look at the bar graphs from 2016 to 2017 to 2018 to 2019, the big changes, there were significant increases from 2016 to 2017 for children tested at 12 months. But the big change really was in the tw 24 months. And we'll, we'll tease that out a little bit uh, in the next couple of slides. So this is a busy, complicated slide. And I want to give credit here to Dr. Elizabeth, to Elizabeth Heights, um, who is uh, a former epidemiologist with us now with the National Center for Health Statistics. Uh, who did this um, uh, sophisticated regression analysis, which basically attempts to show and segment changes in testing rates depending upon whether children lived in areas that were previously considered to be at risk under the 2004 plan or were not considered to be at risk. Um, and so let me just point out uh, some salient features of that um, uh, with a, my handy dandy laser pointer, which I don't know if you can, oh yeah, you can see. Okay, so just to be clear about this, this yellow, this line here represent, this, this is first of all, the group of 12 month old children this is the group of 24 month old children, and this is other children. Um, so the easiest thing to see is we really didn't see any difference before or after in the children not tested at 12 and 24 months. And the regulations didn't really affect those children either. So no change really here. So this line right here, this regression line, represents those children who were tested the testing rates for children at the who lived in areas that were previously not considered to be at risk. So this would be children who, um, uh, Paula, can you admit uh, the person who's waiting? Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, so this area, this line here, look at the difference in this line. Uh, for kids who lived outside of the areas that were previously required testing, um, the difference before and then after at, for the 12 months old. And you can see a significant increase from around 40% to around 60%. So we saw a significant increase in the 12 and 20, in the 12 month olds. Not so much for kids uh, for children who already were required to be tested because they lived previously in areas considered to be at risk. So testing rates in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Frederick Cumberland, areas that pre and Prince George's County, these children, their testing rates did not change appreciably with the new regulations. Again, here for testing at the 24 month uh, at the 24 month age, again, you can see there actually was some increase in children who were lived in areas not previously considered, uh, sorry, previously considered to be at risk. So these would be children living in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Prince George's County, the other older areas. And you can see even here at 24 months, we saw an increase from around 50% to somewhere under 60% in the, 
for those children. But the really big dramatic increase was for kids who were test at 24 months, testing rates for children who were in their second year, at their second year visit, who had not previously been required to be tested they because they lived in areas that were not previously considered to be at risk, these children were tested at a relatively low rate of under 30%, somewhere around 25%. And their testing rates went up to 50 and then almost 60%. So we saw a dramatic increase at 24 months in uh, the rate of testing. Questions about that? All right. This is the story of what happened to blood lead levels. And the salient point is obvious right off the bat. Again, these are children who lived in areas not considered to be previously at risk and previously considered to be at risk. And this is the rate or the percentage of tests done which resulted in or showed that the child had an elevated blood lead level. So the rates of blood lead, elevated blood lead level rates for children who previously lived in areas not considered to be at risk was somewhere either 1% or under. So 99 times out of 100, if you were tested previously before 2016 and you lived in an area that was not considered to be at risk, 99% of those kids had blood lead levels that were not elevated. Everybody clear on that? If you looked at children who lived in areas that were previously considered to be at risk, their blood lead level, their elevated blood lead level rate was significantly higher, 3%, but still declining over this period. And the rate of decline continued in exactly the same rate before and after. So the same thing could be see, seen in the 24 month test, the 24 month old tests, and for other children, uh, children tested less than 72 months. What this shows essentially is healthcare providers were uh, that, that the change in regulations did not result in a change in the overall detection of elevated blood levels. And it's a really important point because I think it speaks to the, uh, it speaks to the idea that um, for this group here and this group here, kids who lived in areas that were not necessarily considered to be at risk, when they were tested, um, the change in testing requirements did not result in a whole new, num whole new increase or a whole increase or a significant increase or any increase in the rate of uh, elevated blood lead, which suggests that pediatricians and healthcare providers were doing a really good job of testing the kids they thought were most at risk of lead poisoning, either before the regulations or after the regulations. So based on this, um, uh, so remember our first goal was to look at the impact of the regulation changes on the rate of blood lead testing. Second was to look at the blood lead levels. And then the third was to evaluate what we ought to do next. So in terms of considering what we ought to do next, we considered three options. One is to maintain the current regulations. Two is to actually redo our testing targeting strategy and revise our regulations based on the distribution of bloodlets that we've observed now that we've been testing everybody across the state. And then the third was to use the historic risk factors of housing age and go back to targeted testing, but not based on blood lead distribution in the state, rather based on the factors that were used in the 2004 targeting plan which were primarily housing. So after due consideration, um, uh, uh, we've reached some conclusions about that. So let me now give you the overall findings and our recommendations. The finding number one is 
Clearly, the regulatory changes in 2015 with the targeting plan and 2016 had a clear positive impact on blood lead testing rates. Now, those have not been persistent because of COVID, but they did clearly improve testing rates overall, especially for children at the 24-month period, uh, at the 24-month visit. Number two, while the increase in blood lead testing did identify more children with blood lead levels between five and nine micrograms per deciliter, we did not see, um, and I sort of made this point in the, the previous slide, elevated blood lead levels in these slides was defined as 10 micrograms per deciliter because that was still the legal limit in Maryland. So we did see an increase in the number of children identified uh, with blood lead levels of five to nine, but not in the number or rate of children with elevated blood lead levels as defined in Maryland at 10 micrograms per deciliter and grade. And then the third finding was with all of that, we're not testing 100% of the children in, in the state, even with the changes in um, uh, the regulations. And we really need to rethink our strategy a little bit with respect to making sure we're catching all the children we need to uh, and uh, identifying. So these are our recommendations. Number one, Maryland should continue the current strategy of defining the entire state as at risk and continue to test all required require testing for all children at 12 and 24 months of age. Um, and the Maryland Department of Health and the Maryland Department of Environment should analyze the distribution of blood lead levels from January 2023 forward in reevaluating the state's testing strategy. I can explain why that is, but I just I think it'll be obvious to you uh, fairly quick. At least three years of data would be required to assess the strategy and impacts of other changes underway in lead poisoning prevention in the state, which includes the HB 1110 and the transition to the lower level of 3.5. So in my opinion, uh, and uh, I believe that at this point, uh, this, uh, this represents, I think, the consensus in the department, is um, we do, we're not recommending changes in the regulations or changing in the strategy at this time because there are so many things that are moving and so many things that have affected testing, including COVID, including the change from, three point, from 5 to 3.5, including HB 1110, that um, it is not prudent at this point to change the regulations or the testing strategy unless and until we have stable data which will take at least three years uh, to obtain. That's recommendation number one. Recommendation number two is MDH and MDE should work with the provider community to increase testing rates overall and improve provider reporting of blood lead test results and data on race and ethnicity. Because of health equity concerns, we know that the data in the Maryland Childhood Lead Registry related to health to um, uh, race and ethnicity is not very good. And uh, we in the medical community and the clinical community and the public health community need to work with uh, the clinical community to improve reporting of race and ethnicity uh, in order to better understand whether or not we are reaching the children we need to reach and whether or not we need new strategies related to lead testing. And then finally, the new blood lead reference value of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter will result in an increase in the number of children who require some clinical and or case management follow-up, and state agencies need to carefully evaluate messaging efforts, resources, and health equity implications of these changes. So I just want to conclude uh, with a couple of acknowledgments. First of all, Elizabeth Heights who was our former uh, CSTE Applied Epidemiology fellow, and, uh, fellow in the Environmental Health Bureau who performed the regression analysis that I so glibly described, which took a huge amount of work and very sophisticated epidemiology uh, and was a cooperative effort with the epidemiologist at the Department of the Environment, Dr. Kavon, who 
as many of you know, I think is uh, in many ways, just as is Secretary Tablada, um, responsible for saving the lives, literally, and saving children uh, from the early 1990s forward. And I can't say enough about the two of them in terms of their dedication and commitment, which will never be recognized in public as it should be, um, to the children of Maryland. And then finally, uh, I'm required to give a disclaimer that uh, the su uh, support for this work came from environmental public health tracking uh, and uh, other grants uh, at uh, the Department of the Environment and the Department of Health. Uh, but the views expressed are really uh, the departments and, and not, uh, not um, uh, CDCs. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen um, and open it up for comments or questions. Camille. Um, my, my only comment is just some of the utter, and you heard some of this in the health department forum, the utter confusion with providers on the importance of testing. Um, they know it's important. Some of them do it, some don't, and, and there's no, there's there, and I hate to use this word, but there's no punishment for those who don't test. So, because because most of the funding that we receive or that is is distributed is is around case management. It's after the fact, not before the fact. So I guess I'm, I always struggle with um, just just pushing both messages. And I guess, and and if I'm struggling with it, clearly the other health departments are struggling with it and trying to figure out how to be more cohesive in our dual messages. If that makes sense. <laughs> No, it very much makes sense. Um, uh, let me just get to Dr. Rogers and then um, sure. we can talk about that. But I, I have a lot of thoughts about that, Camille. But one thing I will say, um, and this is a commitment that I expressed uh, on my own some time ago, which I am still committed to doing, is uh, I am committed to working with the childhood lead registry data um, to create dashboards for providers so they know what testing is going on and what, what and and i believe that that will be a very important tool but i also want to recognize dr rogers and the work that he's doing to improve testing and so dr rogers yeah yeah thank you i appreciate it um uh, we're getting feedback from the uh, pediatric practices that we work with is it's so hard to get them in to get testing done and they don't follow up they feel their child's being brutalized by quest or lab core uh, they don't have trained people to deal with pediatrics. And a lot of times they, the follow-ups uh, for lead testing are, are done during the acute care visits. And what I'm trying to do and try to get across to the uh, pediatricians is to work with the health departments on case management. The case management people can go out to the house. They can track down people who often move from house to house uh, too. So we, we're working on that. And Cliff and I will be talking more about uh, some strategies to deal with that. Um, but a second comment was is an excellent presentation, Cliff. Really nice, nice data. Um, I think it fits with what we're seeing in the medical literature about targeted testing, universal testing. It certainly fits with that picture. Uh, my third question is, did you do any cost-benefit analysis? Um, we're talking about government funds and taxes and so on, too. Did you do a cost-benefit analysis, even a quality-of-life assessment uh, in terms of identification of children that may not have been picked up otherwise? So we did a cost benefit, a cost effectiveness analysis in the original targeting plan strategy and uh, regulations change. I did not repeat it here in part because uh, of two factors. The first foremost is, um, you know, 2020 to 2022, I don't know what to do with any of those data. COVID has so screwed up the, all of the metrics for everybody, for everything, that in a way, I don't know, we're, we're sort of going to carve those data out of existence in some respects. So, um, uh, because COVID just changed the landscape for everybody. I do think that um, when we get to, and I, I, I take your point on this, Paul, I think when we have the opportunity to get more stable data over the next several years, it will be important for us to do a cost cost effectiveness and cost impact analysis 
um, to look at the costs of testing and the uh, identification of kids with elevated blood lead levels. At some point, and I think we've talked about this before, I do believe that we will determine that there may be a need to go back to a more targeted testing strategy because the diffuse sort of try to catch everybody strategy. Um, the question is, what can we do about this, those kids who are most at risk? But one of the things that I think is happening right now, and this is something that's happening at the health department, we are starting to look at race and ethnicity and health equity concerns. And cost benefit analysis without taking into effect, taking into consideration health equity can sometimes be an incomplete picture. So I guess what I'm saying is I punted on the cost impact analysis for right now because I don't think it will accurately tell us what to do at this moment because of what's the impact of COVID and the change in the regulations. But I do believe that with improved data, it will be important to look at cost effectiveness in several years. So I hope that's hope that's helpful. Manjula, Paul, did you have a, just a quick comment back on that? Yeah, just a real quick comment. Um, I think RSV is going to replace COVID in the next couple of years. I don't think you're always never going to get really clean data. <laughs> well, yeah, there there is that. Yeah, there is that. Manjula. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell. It's a really very um, highlighted presentation. I love the um, regression map and also the numbers. Um, that also highlights the increase in the testing for 24 months older. Um, that's really true because at age 12 months, the health care providers give the lab slip for testing and there is no follow up and parents just take the slip home and it's sitting there the child goes back for the for immunization at age 16 months and 18 months then the health care that's the time the health care provider follows up with the health uh, late testing and realizes that oh the 12 month test was not performed so at least now let's do the 24 months testing instead of sending the child back so that's a clear reason for increase in the 24 months testing, not the 12 months testing. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is there is no follow up after the lab test, the slip is given to the parent for anyone to go check whether at least the high risk children. Uh, I yeah. know I love the universal testing because we don't want any child regardless of to be affected with late exposures and the poisoning. But there are some social determinants that are affecting um, unequally some children and these children are left behind without being tested increasing the risk for the poisoning and so we there is obvious gap in the follow-up and i really do not know how we can really make this happen because it's a last time from 12 months to 24 months for especially the children who are living in the high risk areas and with other social determinants um so something to consider and then what happens with the child care programs and they are being um, the child care providers they do want to make sure that the children are tested and the parents end up signing the religious objection after the 12 months because they are unable to go get tested it's an easy way to get the children continue to stay in the child care programs once the religious exemption comes into the farm that uh, delays or obstructs the 24 months testing also so that defeats the entire purpose of having these children tested either at 12, 12 months or 24 months but even preventing getting the children tested at 24 months just because they choose the religious option after 12 months because they could not get testing done for various reasons so this is the comment uh, I would like to make to the commission and to you also to see what we can do to the follow up, uh, whether pushing with the health insurance companies for making sure these children are being tested after 12 months when the health care pediatricians and the nurse practitioners provide the slip to them. Really do not know, but I'm just, th this is a gap as, um, nurse consultant for the early education program that I'm finding it 
and bringing it to your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Manjula. I, I, so a couple of uh, thoughts and comments, and then I, I see that there's another hand up. Um, so <clears throat> one question, I mean, one, one comment is we have tried to strengthen the form uh, 4620, the, the, the testing form, to make it very clear that the um, that the, the the form has to be signed by the provider, so that the the, the person can't cite their own religious objection. They still have to have documentation that they've discussed this with their provider. Their provider acknowledges that there's a that there's a religious exemption, but that they've also counseled the uh, uh, patient. Again, we don't have perfect controls over clinical practice. Dr. Rogers will tell you, and I will tell you, and others who are in the clinical world will tell you, providers have latitude in the way they practice, and that will not change, I think. You know, we can't, we, we can't compel people. We, we, we have challenges compelling people to do many things, including vaccinations and testing and various other things. And we, as a, as a state, and as a profession, have chosen always, for the most part, to rely on education and other incentives. Uh, and I do believe that this, too, is a matter of education and letting people know about the importance of doing appropriate follow-up testing if they have an initial blood lead that's elevated. I will say that one of the things that the local health departments have been doing, and I give them a lot of credit, as well as MDE, is making sure that the providers are aware of the elevated test lead, red, lead test results and making sure that they know that there should be a follow-up test for, con, for both con, confirmation and then also a subsequent test to make sure that the lead level isn't continuing to go up. So I, we've discussed this with both MDE and with the local health departments. They're all very much in the loop and work with the local and the healthcare providers to pass that message along. And you know, aside from that, the other incentives that are out there, those fiscal incentives for doing testing appropriately, primarily affect the managed care organizations in their relationship with Medicaid. They don't as directly affect the providers themselves. Um, Eamon Flynn, did you have a comment? Yeah, I had a quick question. That's probably more for um, Camille and maybe some of our other local health department folks. But I'm wondering if there is a difference in the perception of parents receiving the message, your child needs to be tested because every child needs to be tested versus your child needs to be tested because of X, Y, Z, you are a high risk and kind of triggering, triggering some of those thoughts about related to social determinants of health and whether one message is... Um, is more effective at behavior modification to get the child tested um, or not. And, and I should explain that uh, Eamon Flynn, for those of you who don't know, is our senior policy analyst, is senior policy analyst in the Environmental Health Bureau and actually worked with me on this report. Uh, Eamon, Baltimore City probably isn't the best one to answer this question only because we we've always tested everybody. Yeah. So it, it probably is a better question in one of the counties that didn't. And and we push testing no matter what. It has to happen in order to get to school, in order to get to child care. I mean, we literally list all the things that don't happen if you don't get tested. And it's just in your child's best interest, that kind of thing. And we push all of our services, but it, you might get more information from a county that wasn't a part of universal testing. And Cliff, you can certainly chime in there. Oh, did you want me to chime in? Yeah, no, I, I, the only thing I would say is I agree with you. I do think that there is, <clears throat> there is probably a difference in parental perception between uh, hearing that your child in particular is at risk and, uh, uh, and then the general message. But I see Dr. Rogers and Secretary Tablada both have their hands raised. And, uh, uh, but I, I think Dr. Rogers had his hand raised first. Oh, real quick, Cliff. And this, conversation could probably last all day and I don't want to see it last all day. I just want to make one comment that 
I mentioned how important it is for the physicians and pediatricians to test children and, and do follow up and we're educating them on that. Um, I met with the local health department here and in Worcester County and I asked them, what do you wish pediatricians would know about lead testing? What, was you, what would you wish we could tell them? And they said, it's so important for the pediatrician to educate the parents of why they're doing the blood testing for lead. It's so important they don't, they're not doing that. Yeah. Now, I, this is a lead in to anybody in the commission. What else do, do you wish pediatricians knew about lead testing? You can email me that offline and I will be passing that information along in our next uh, lecture. So anything that you think pediatricians should know and don't seem to know, uh, or providers in general, please let me know offline. Secretary Tablada. Uh, thanks, Cliff. Uh, three three thing observations mainly. One, uh, you can comment on the uh, that not the intravenous test, but the uh, the screening test, the one that just pricked the finger. Yes. Because I know that resisting of parents of taking children to uh, uh, you know to a to, to a lab to get blood drawn, even though a lot of practices now they take your blood right there in the practice, but it's still the, the quote unquote trauma of the child going through uh, getting blood taken out. But the the screening tool or the or, or the uh, finger, you know, just pricking the finger and getting blood that way. I don't know the status of that. If that's legitimate, not legitimate for for the purpose because parents. When the second thing I was point that I want to make is when once the parents leave with the sleep from the lab, you know, then transportation becomes an issue, another inconvenience to get out of the house to go to a lab. I mean, even me as an adult person, when I get a lot of sleep from a doctor, I sometimes forget about it, then I gotta go get tested again until my next visit to the doctor. Oh, I forgot to get my blood tested. So it is something that that it'd be good to um to the that convenience is 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 uh ties into the people not following it up and uh the the second observation also there is the on the religious exemption i'm not uh you know I'd, I'd like to understand why people think i mean one thing is the vaccine uh for exemption but for testing there you know i don't know what will be that exemption there but i'm just curious more than anything else and the last thing is on the ethnicity and race that's, that should be the follow-up also with the housing where they live because, uh, as you know, as we all know, lead poison is not hereditary. It's not like uh, that's something that in, I'm a Hispanic person, Latino, and we all tend to have liver problems. So if it doesn't hereditary, I have a cardiac problem, that's hereditary, as opposed to where do you live? So the, the housing, uh, I know it speaks to the issue that if you're an immigrant, more likely live in a lower, uh, in a started home and may have more lead in it, but that's not always the case. So, so I think it's in, in relevant to the race and ethnicity should be the house where they they're currently living because that ties into what Ruthen's going to be doing with in the housing projects, uh, housing, you know, creating a healthy home, and uh, so that's my my speech. And and uh, uh, Secretary de Blada, I, I first of all thank you for being here for this presentation and for the discussion, which I think is really important because you have that long perspective on lead poisoning prevention here in the state. Um, uh, a couple of just quick responses before I get to Christina. One is with respect to um, uh, the religious exemption. Uh, generally speaking. Providers don't usually question a religious exemption on the part of their patients um, I, because it gets a little bit, um, uh, there, there's, a, there's the extent to which, first of all, it, is, it, <clears throat> it probably is claimed by more people than who actually have a bona fide religious exemption. Uh, but providers, I think in general, and Paul may want to comment on that, but I think it's gen generally self-evident uh, providers don't usually push back on them uh, because it it gets into a dicey discussion it can be with uh, with patients with respect to capillary testing uh, point of care testing as you recall in 2014 we had a commission uh, to encourage point of care testing and in fact we have seen dramatic increases in point of care testing um, 
that has slowed a little bit, partly due to the uh, problems with the test kits that occurred two years ago, um, and partly as a result of just a bunch of other things. But it is true, we have encouraged point of care testing. It has increased, and that I think is partly, and Kayvon always thought that that was uh, one of the big factors for responsible for the increase in testing as well, because it happened at about the same time in the 2015, 16, 17. Um, uh, with respect to the convenience of lab testing, generally, you are completely correct. Every doctor knows that when you give a lab slip to somebody to go get tested, they may or may not get the test. And lead is not really different in that regard. What is different is the resistance of parents who feel that their ch children are going to suffer at the hands of uh, phlebotomy techs uh, in the in the labs, and I think that does increase the amount of non-responsiveness. But again, Paul has more direct contact with the pediatric community. Um, and then the final point with respect to race and ethnicity, we are looking very hard at race, ethnicity, and other determinants of health across all of our health department programs. This is no different than that, and I agree with you. There is no genetic component to lead toxicity. It's all a question of exposure, which is all a question of where you live and what kind of housing. Christina? Uh, I just mentioned the religious exemption default with what Manjula said, and basically what you said is that, for example, in the child care community, we have to have the health inventory. And if it's not updated and you know parents can't get child care, they tend to be able to figure out a way to make sure that their child can come back the next day or whenever is necessary because they need to go to work. Um, and so those are some of the reasons why there's pushback, you know, and barriers for that, even if yep. it's not legitimate. Yep. Um, uh, okay. Any other discussion <clears throat> of the uh, evaluation or the recommendations? Okay, uh, Paula, um, once again, the big dog, um, so, or not, uh, there we go. So um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, commission calendar that dates for 2023, Paula, did you have any specific dates you wanted to discuss? Uh, no. I. I think we're just going to table that until Wendy comes back. Um, it'll just be easier because I'm not sure that we have anything on the calendar um, for January at this time as far as presenting. Okay, that's that's fine. All right. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, well, uh, then why don't we just consider that tabled, um, and then let's move on to the uh, next item, the next agenda item, which is uh, pending legislation. Uh, does anybody have any thing to say about pending legislation? I don't. Okay, uh, the, the new General Assembly will meet and then there will be legislation that then something will happen. All right, um, if that's the case, um, let's just quickly go, I believe MDE um, already described some of those things and I think Tyler had to leave uh, but uh, Paula, anything else on the, from the lead program? I have nothing, thank you. Uh, Dr. Boss Victoria is on and Shamola Dai, uh, the epidemiologist is on. Um, I wonder um, uh, who, uh, is it worth mentioning uh, uh, that there was a national CLIP meeting and did MDD attend the national CLIP meeting? The, Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Programs meeting.
this is Dr. Boss Victoria. And no, I did not attend that meeting. Um, okay. Uh, and I see Fred uh, is not on. So, um, uh, Paula, and Paula, you didn't go to the fifth meeting, did you? Sorry, was it the CDC meeting? Yeah. For, oh, um, I did not, but I'm sure Camille uh, went, or maybe not. Sorry, Camille. Sorry to put you on the spot. Camille? I did not attend, and I'll just go ahead and, and co-op the hot topics right now. Myself and Catherine Taylor, my uh, colleague from Baltimore City DHCD, are the newest members of the Leadership Academy for Public Health from, from the CDC. So we have been consumed with that. We're in this current cohort presenting some of the great work that Baltimore City is doing um, to our colleagues around the country. Fantastic. Well, that's great news, but okay. But we don't have anything specific from the National Cliff meeting. Okay. Nope. All right. Um, uh, and then uh, Dr. Boss Victoria, I just, any any updates on uh, Stellar and helps the uh, data transition? Basically, we are anticipating by the end of this year, 2022, 20, that we will have uh, helps in a position for production. We are in that. Uh, still testing and communicating with the laboratories that are currently making their transition of the HL7 or the electronic reporting record. Um, we are still receiving our uh, reports, of course, by fax and by mailing. Now, uh, currently, we have been challenged in communicating with many of the uh, sites that are submitting their point of care reporting uh, as we've making this adjustment. And I'm finding that um, versus uh, giving the values that may be being presented directly from the analyzer. We have a uh, reporting that is simply saying less than 3.5 versus giving us that actual value, which is concerning uh, when we're trying to differentiate those outcomes that are truly low. Traditionally, we had been receiving reports of being less than one or less than 1.33, which gave us more confidence of what we are reporting. But when they report less than 3.5, um, it's right there at our border, you know, and therefore we're having to give follow up, uh, make phone calls to try to uh, re-educate how important it is to record the actual value. And as you know, we are still in this um, position of the extended recall. And we have learned in that experience that many times it was because no one really checked for the expiration date. And when you push, to get that verification um, of what is the expiration date of the kits that they are currently using. Now, many doing the recall, of course, had to reorder, but we still had some that was reporting that they had stock on hand. So point of care being uh, reinforced as a screening too. And under those circumstances, we have tried to communicate that that screening tool is, we have more confidence, let's say, 
in the lower levels, but a lower level that is equivalent to what we're saying is in fact our reference level is not exactly the way we want the so recording. Dr. Dr. Ross Victoria, I'm going to make a suggestion. <laughs> is <clears throat> I wonder if it would be worth having a discussion with uh, us at the health department, maybe include Dr. Rogers, and we could talk about some potential outreach strategies to the provider community about these issues? Yes, I have talked with Dr. Rogers most recently and shared um, several areas that he is incorporating in his summarization with the physicians that is a part of his group. But I agree that the communication may need a broader scope yep. uh, in talking with the physicians that are calling in. Of course, we can be very direct about why that need is for the Venus test when indeed it has reached the reference level. However, that is very individual at this time. So I would agree we need to have further conversations uh, as well as continue to define those particular, because we have several new um, outreach areas, uh, smaller venues that are doing the point of care testing. Yeah. Some are very much, uh, let's say in the past three to four months. So under those circumstances, it is taking quite a bit of uh, additional education uh, because I'm not sure what packet they are receiving when, especially with the new values as they are now, uh, are receiving as they start their work. But they, yeah. when they contact us, then we have that opportunity. But when we start just receiving the results in the mail, then we have to look at what we're receiving. And yeah. basically that's where the concern is uh, being highlighted. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I would just like to, uh, Paula, I would like to propose, um, uh, and, and we don't, this is not a commission activity, but it will be, I think, between the two agencies um some discussion about this and about implementation of uh helps i would like to uh suggest uh dr boss victoria that one of the things that we do is um maybe consider um because the local health departments will need to be involved in helps and starting up i wonder if it's worth getting a little working group together of external potential users uh to to sort of beta test Um, I, I agree with you. I'm not sure what the, I mean, I, I'm sure we would have to go through some, you know, IT, yep. um, procedures through that because I'm, I think we're limited in the number of people that, you know, no, I, I'm not suggesting, I'm okay. not suggesting this instant, but I'm just sort of thinking about when I've introduced new technology and given the sort of big questions because right now there are still questions in the local health departments, especially about whether this is going to, <clears throat> how this is going to affect the current case management uh, software, which for many health departments is REDCap. And uh, so before, before moving too far down the road, we sort of need to think about a strategy. And I think that it will be important to have the user community involved in the strategy development. That's my only uh, um, I, I agree. Something that um, Dr. Boss um, hinted on, which is a little concerning, is uh, the inability to get the lower blood leads, um, you know, reported. Yeah, that's, that won't be a function of the software. That's a function of our education of the, with the providers. Okay. About the reporting. I think that's well, an issue. Okay. But Stephanie has her hand up. Okay. 
Um, yes, hi, Cliff. I, I will take your suggestion back to um, our Office of Information and Technology. We, a group of us meet, Rena's group, we meet with them weekly, sometimes more than once a week yeah. to work on helps and implementation and testing and all of those things. So I will um, raise that suggestion of, you know, maybe having an external group that includes MDH and whoever else you think should participate and see, you know, what's the feasibility of doing that, like for beta testing. And I'll also mention to them that there is concern among the local health departments that there could be some issues um, with helps and how it would interact with the software that they use, the REDCap um, program. Yeah, no, and Stephanie, I, I do this in the interest of sort of figuring out what's going to work most effectively for you and the local health departments together. Yeah. I think, you know, this will be a big change yeah. when it happens. And uh, the more planning we do on it, the better. Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you, uh, you know, some of us have tried. Um, I don't think, I think helps is going to happen. Um, it, it's going to be helps. I can pretty much say that. 99.9% .9 no matter, regardless of what, you know, yeah. other thoughts um, and other suggestions have been out there, but I will raise that concern because I know the intent initially was to roll helps out sometime this month. Yeah. I, don't, I can't say for certain that we're on, tr on track to do that. I know that yep. the push is to try to be on track to do that. So I will, you know, raise this, with, as a matter of fact, there's a meeting this afternoon at three. I'm going to bring this up during that meeting. No, that's great, Stephanie. Uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to sort of break, take this out of the blue, but I thought it was probably. I, I knew that you guys were talking about it. I think it was a good time to raise it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else from MDE? All right. MDH. Do I have anything to say? Um, <laughs> do I ever? No, um, uh, we we will be um, officially releasing the the revised form forty six twenty once we get the official approval back. And Eamon, I don't think we yet have a an official stamp on that yet, do we? No, not yet. I said all right, but not. but I anticipate it won't take long. So I look for early January sometime, perhaps. To have the revised form 4620 uh, out uh, on the website. Um, other than that, I will just say we're meeting. We we met with the local health department case management team uh, across the state. Um, uh, there's a great deal of eagerness on uh, sort of how the 3.5 is going to roll out. Um, the local health departments are looking for guidance from both MDE and MDH. So we will definitely be working together to try to have coherent messages. So Camille, I take your point. Do you want to mention December 10th? Do I want to mention December 10th? Yes. Sure, December 10th. <laughs> or GHHI will announce December 10th, the event that we're doing at Mondaman Mall. Yeah, no, I, I. why don't you do that? Because you have more details than I do. Okay. I'll, I will. I won't go out of order. We got DHCD first. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if Jack. Are you here, or is anybody from DHCD here? The state. I don't think they're here. On. I don't think they're here. Yeah. All right. So Camille. Um, two things. One. I'm sorry. I was blanking. I did go to the national clip meeting. It was a week before Thanksgiving, so it was a little bit of a blur. It was. Yeah. Yeah from 12 to five, both days. So yeah. it was a, they were long days, but they were great days. And we actually, Cliff, you'll be happy to know, had a spirited conversation with WIC in the head of WIC and our thoughts about not being able to, to access WIC. So there may be some follow-ups from that on the national level and I'll include you because we certainly gave that that poor lady, um, a, I mean, she, she heard a lot from around the country about WIC's unwillingness to partner yeah, yeah. um Interesting. that's great to yeah hear. i'm not sure what will come of it but we were quite vocal yeah um, 
On December 10th, we are doing an event at Madame and Wall with GHHI Center Court. I'll be there. Cliff will be there. Of course, Ruthann will be there. We'll be doing some testing and just trying to raise awareness um, in the winter months about lead poisoning prevention and some of the initiatives um, that GHHI has. And I've also invited some other folk from the Office of Chronic Disease Prevention to join me right before Christmas in the mall. It's absolutely beautiful, so please come. I will also mention that we at the health department are um, focusing now on improving our relationship with our housing code enforcement people, because we're recognizing that there's a lot we don't know when citizens go to code enforcement and they have lots of other things going on. So we're trying to be more holistic in our approach when there are other issues going on in the house other than lead. Um, and this also includes the asthma initiative that they could possibly tap into some other grant programs at DHCD if we look at it as one whole issue. And we, we tried to do this before, but we, we are really focusing on looking at the home, not just in lead, not just in asthma, but one of the things we also talk about is kind of mold and bed mm -hmm. bugs and things that we can't do anything about. There may actually be some funding there to do some of those things. So we're trying to think of them as a package, which is some out of the box new thinking, but not new thinking. So wanted to put That's that right. out there. That's terrific. Uh, Paul, anything else from the uh, Academy of Pediatrics? Um, uh, two things. One, I look forward to um, uh, the group that you talk about, a working group. I think that sounds really great. I just had one other question. The EPA currently put out an announcement asking for a comment about uh, regulations that should be issued to uh, control the lead in gasoline used in piston engine airplanes, uh, the biggest source of pollution uh, with lead in around those airports. Um, is there interest at your level to comment on that too or i just wondered um if there's anybody else interested let's, in let's have a con them? yeah let's have a conversation offline about that. yeah okay great all right um uh housing authority for baltimore city not here not there okay all right um uh let's see who else um uh what about mangela any updates from the office of child care no sir not at this moment thank you okay uh maryland insurance administration benita's not here all right and then i saw wes a little while ago any other ghhi updates other than the 10th uh, thanks, Cliff. Um, just want to make sure, Ruthann may have mentioned her open remarks, the EPA report is out, uh, the new strategy to reduce lead exposure and, and disparities for lead. Um, one thing is it has a whole section on emissions, what we were just talking about. So it involves lead, water, paint, soil emissions as well. So that's the very last week of October that I came out, um, if people are interested. And then the other, just um, anyone doing work with city, county level, We'd love the state to contribute more, but the ARPA funding around the country is really picking up for jurisdictions that are dedicating their American Rescue Plan money directly to lead. So um, we were appreciative of the 2.5, uh, but around the country, we're seeing some big, Milwaukee with 29 million for lead, Cleveland with 17, state of New Jersey, 170 million, Connecticut, 30 million. So a lot of these jurisdictions also don't know where to always spend all their ARPA money. So again, it's a great opportunity for any commissioners or any of the state agencies working with the local cities and counties to ask them to allocate some dollars towards lead um, at the local level. So it's just a great opportunity because um, a lot of jurisdictions may even allocate it and then it starts coming back because it's not getting spent for other purposes. So yeah, yeah. Hey, all right. Camille, can you have Chevelle send an updated email about the December 10th event and who's going to be there? Yes. So we can send it to the commission? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. Thank you, Wes. Thanks, Camille. All right. Any other commissioner updates from any other uh, commissioners? Uh, Cliff, I just want to make sure there was a 
Department of Housing and Community Development for Baltimore City. I uh, We kind of skipped past them for agency updates. I didn't see anyone on, but I, just I, double checked. I yeah, I didn't see anybody on either, and I asked, and I think Camille said no. Um, I'm here. Uh, Catherine's, Catherine's here. here. Oh, yeah. Catherine. Yeah, my, my apologies. I, I, I stepped out for a little bit, so you probably didn't notice, uh, and I just hopped back in. Um, yeah. No, that's great. Um, uh, any updates? Uh, right now, with the lead uh, hazard reduction program that is with uh, DACD Baltimore City, uh, we are currently uh, are looking to hire for a program manager. Um, so I just wanted to put the word out there that we are looking to fill that position to help uh, with our efforts. Um, and we are also hiring for community aides. If you guys do have any interested parties, uh, they can email me directly and I can also put my email in the chat if you guys have anything to send my way. All right, Catherine, uh, congratulations on your new position. Oh, thank you, Cliff. Uh, and we are looking forward to working. We are very much looking forward to working. Me, the, just the same as me, we are ready to get this program up and running. We've been stagnant for so long because of yep. COVID and uh, we have a lot of uh, staff that are eager to really start putting, getting these units done. Yep. Uh, hopefully we've been able to get uh, at least 10 uh, units done so far and we're hoping to increase our efforts um, in the future. Perfect, fabulous, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any members of the public uh, who would like to speak, would you be so kind if you are on the um, uh, uh, chat? Can you just put your name in the chat so we can record it? Uh, is there anybody who from the member of the public who wants to speak? If you're on the phone, just uh, you know, yell or something else. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak? Going once, going twice. Um, uh, okay, well, this is the juncture and the point in the meeting where usually I would entertain a uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, and when I say, when I entertain, what I'm saying is I'm inviting a motion to adjourn. And the first hand goes to Christina. Uh, is there a second? There, I see five or six seconds. Um, and uh, as you all know, a motion to adjourn is not debatable uh, under Robert's rules of order. So uh, with that said, um, I want to wish you all a very, very good December holiday, etc. cetera. Uh, please be safe. Uh, thank you for all of that you have done this year, in spite of the many challenges. Um, we're looking forward to working with you next year. So be well, uh, everybody. We'll see you in 2023. See you in 2023. Have a good one. Take care, all. Happy holidays. Mm -hmm. Yep. Bye-bye.